So I'm here to talk about FreeBSD development and production. Uh, I'm Sean. I work at HashiCorp. I am a mostly retired FreeBSD person. However, it is my operating system of choice. I have a tendency to drop it off and deploy it wherever possible because I like that, what we have done. Um, Development and production uh, at work, we, uh, I'm very passionate about getting applications off of developer laptops into production and having them be stable in production for extended periods of time. Once you have an application that you, or an idea for an application, develop it, you do something on your laptop, and eventually you get into production where the application actually spends most of its, uh, its life. It takes maybe three, six months for an application in, in kind of like normal web scale uh, companies or, or, or web applications to, um, be developed and taken to production, fine. But then, again, it, it runs for three plus years, so that's production, and you want to have that process from laptop to production be as seamless as possible. Now, that's great and all, but it has a tendency, or it has, over the years, things have evolved such that, you know, these tools didn't largely exist, but as history has evolved, things have largely um, been kind of taken over by Linux. And what we would really like to see, or I would definitely like to see, is FreeBSD at each one of these kind of elements where we're going from development to production. And so the, the application lifecycle has a tendency to look like this, where you do some development, you test, and you figure out what it is that you're going to do. You put it into production. You monitor to see if you, like, what happened, get some feedback from the application, and then you know, rinse, repeat, and you do the cycle all over again. So to begin with, I'm going to start talking about doing development on FreeBSD, which may sound odd given that we're at a developer conference. So um, dev to prod, things that matter when you're doing development on FreeBSD um, or just any application is what's the cost of, of, of acquiring a resource? Because if you're going to do some development, you need to make, uh, you are interested in having that experience be as frictionless as possible. The efficiency of research and development is, is inversely proportional to the cost of acquiring resources, right? So. If you want to acquire and do development on FreeBSD, how expensive is that, right? Uh, and right now, it turns out in cloud environments, that's kind of expensive. It's getting much better, um, but uh, it's kind of expensive, and, and it's not a first world thing or first class thing that, that us as a community largely think about. So uh, I have a quick question, and this is you know interactive portion, a little bit interactive here. Who's here has heard of Vagrant? We've all heard of VMs, but who here has heard of Vagrant? About three quarters of the room, um, have heard of Vagrant and never used it. Okay, that's maybe a third of the room. Uh, used it once or twice. Okay, another 20% maybe. And then people that live day in and day out in Vagrant. All right, we got a really small minority in the back there. Um, so uh, one of the things that's interesting is, you know, we want to, to be able to believe that, that um, people are developing on FreeBSD, and it turns out that that may actually also be problematic. So uh, we keep track of download stats for uh, vagrant images. So going top down, 22 to, like on the smaller side of things, 1 million downloads in the last year for development environments. Okay, let that order of magnitude sink in for a second, because inside of the FreeBSD community, it's very different. Very, very different. Okay. This order of magnitude difference is representative of the difference in usage in production environments in data centers for FreeBSD versus Linux. Okay. For better or worse, this is kind of our reality. Uh, Starship Troopers, if you didn't catch the reference. So, Linux is a really popular thing, obviously, um, and it would be really nice if, if FreeBSD was this very popular thing. So we did this, uh, we had this test that we did at work um, for spinning up Linux containers, and this was due to customer uh, interest, and we spun up a million containers, and we did it in about five minutes, and we did this on, uh, this particular test on GCP, uh, Google Cloud Platform. And that's great. That's, that's a reasonably large deployment, right? A million containers on 100,000 or uh, 5,000 nodes. That, that's a reasonable thing. Turns out that, that um, Citadel, they're the second largest uh, options hedge fund in, I think I said that right, um, in the world. Um, they came out and they were interested in this as well. And they actually just gave a talk uh, and they were spinning up north of that because they needed to do uh, computation and simulations, I think it was Monte Carlo is probably what they were doing, 
um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 million containers in a day, right? This is large scale computing at this point in time. Um, it would be really nice if some of that was happening in or on FreeBSD. So how do we get to the point where a lot of the tools that companies that are, are driving this kind of demand, how do we get it so that the operating system is fungible? Right? So I'm going to go through some of the, the developer workflow for doing this kind of rapid iterative development on FreeBSD using some of these tools. Um, but I'm mostly interested in getting to the point where the operating system is a fungible line item in a config file. So uh, Vagrant is a command line tool that lets you codify and describe uh, the, uh, a particular operating system. So in this case, thank you to Release Engineering, we have official Va uh, FreeBSD uh, VMs. And you can just go Vagrant init FreeBSD, and it will download, um, I nuked a slide. Uh, it will download a, uh, a copy of the, of the official uh, FreeBSD image and let you begin to work pretty much instantly. Um, you have to make a little bit of a, a few you know, twiddles um, because we don't default to a normal shell. You have to explicitly say SH. So there's a little bit of friction there. Um, but then um, you know, when you hit Vagrant up, it goes and downloads, does everything for you, and just kind of works. And what that means is, Oops, little snag. That was the shell. I had these out of order, sorry. Um, what that means is you can go in and, um, if you go and edit your Vagrant file, toss in the, the missing line there, you can, in a really small amount of time, spin up a local development environment. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is from a developer perspective, I mentioned friction earlier, is this, this synced folders. This is an interesting one because there isn't official support from upstream like VMware providers, other virtualization providers for the uh, VMware HGFS, or I forget what the name of it. Um, you have to use NFS to talk to FreeBSD in order to share files from your, your laptop onto the VM. So if my VM is, let's say, you know, FreeBSD and my laptop is OS X, uh, you use this NFS synced folder trick here. Um, and it means that your files that are in your local directory where you did this, this you know, Vagrant file sh will also show up in the VM mounted at slash Vagrant. Sorry about the, the line wrap there. Okay. And on OS X, it's not that hard. Um, you go and throw some stuff into sudoers in order to enable NFSD because you know, OS X for, or, or Mac OS is, is, is actually a Unix. Um, in, debatable maybe, but probably not. Um, is you've got NFSD and you, you want to give Vagrant the ability to go and restart NFS and um, be able to mount things inside of your guest. And your guest will do that automatically. So the first time you bring up a VM, you probably want to throw the, the destroy on error, specifically so that you know, if something times out in the initialization, which is reasonably common to have happen, um, you don't have this you know, multi-gig artifact sitting on your disk. It'll kind of clean up after itself. But it, that's basically it. Like, it's vagrant up. And then you can Vagrant SSH. And this is what I meant with the, the shared files. So you go, I'm, I'm working inside, after I Vagrant SSH, I'm working inside of this, this, uh, this VM that, you know, from a terminal perspective, looks like an, I didn't have to spin up anything. It, it's just kind of like a handful of commands that I ran. But it, it's interactive. It's bidirectional, right? So I can go to CD Vagrant inside of the VM. I can do whatever. I can log out of that and go back to the host operating system here, and I can see, and, and this actually contains you know, the, the same uname information. This is, makes it really nice because then I get to use all of my normal desktop productivity tools, but then I can go into the actual VM itself that bridge is in place, and I can you know, hack around, do something, blow up the environment. It doesn't matter because this slash vagrant directory exists on the host, not inside of the guest VM. So I can go and end. Uh, I, I've done some, some terrible things this way, let me put it that way, and it, the, it's consequence free. Right? The friction of doing development this way is very, very low. And for some that seems like, oh yeah, the VMs are kind of expensive, like it's, it's VMware um, ESX or something, you know, this is on your laptop. I, it, it's very easy to go simulate four and eight node clusters to go and do work all locally without having to go spin anything up. And when I say that, it's, that you know, friction's a big deal, it turns out it doesn't take a whole lot of time. I'm talking two and a half seconds to go put a VM to sleep. This ends up being a really nice way to work, by the way, because when my laptop goes to sleep or I want to reboot my laptop, if I use Vagrant to go and do that, my state's maintained. <laughs> and if I work inside of the host OS and I restart my box, 
I just lost all of my state and I have to go and recreate that. So if you live inside of you know, Emacs or VI or whatever it is and, and you uh, would rather just go Control Z or Command Z and uh, then log out of your VM and suspend it and have everything just work when you come back, this is kind of a nice little workflow. Um, so similarly to Vagrant Suspend in order to put an existing VM to sleep, you can bring it back up. Great. And again, it's 18 seconds in order to bring the machine back up the first time or uh, after it coming out of sleep. And that's largely I.O. bound. So when you're doing work, you may have many different copies of, of, of um, uh, different VMs running. So Vagrant Status, you can figure out what's there. These VMs do take up RAM and they do take up disk space. Uh, it, important to just note because it, you can very easily accumulate hundreds of gigs. I recently filled up my laptop with about 250 gigs worth of VMs. Some of them were dead, some of them were just hanging around. Um, and along with working on VMware, there's VirtualBox, and I'm going to come back to a special little treat here in a second, um, uh, but Beehive is also on its way. Um, so when you're done with this and you actually do want to destroy it because you want to have this kind of like non-permanent environment where you're able to spin up and then tear down, spin up and tear down, and you want to be able to do that on a regular basis, eh, they're going to destroy. And it doesn't take hardly any time, right? Again, this is the really important thing. Acquiring resources, the cost and time required to acquire resources in order to do development needs to be small. So I've got plenty of VMs in this particular case, and you can see all of them across my entire box using Vagrant Global Status, and that works out really nice. Um, now, there's some amount of tedium that you have to do every time you spin up a box and you want to make that go away. Great. So inside your Vagrant, provider, or Vagrant scripts, or Vagrant files, you can set a shell provisioner and run things by default. So in this case, I'm doing a FreeBSD update fetch, uh, FreeBSD update install, package audit, and installing the Go programming language. Um, and there's lots of different things that you can do here. Um, but this concept of like, you know, you have an OS and then you have the provisioning of it. Now, that provisioning only happens the first time you go and spin something up. So every time you do a vagrant destroy and then a vagrant up, it will recreate and rerun your provisioning script. So this is where you would throw in all of your like, your administrative developer things that you want to have be there every time without having to go back and manually do this. And if, if you get, become disciplined with the information that you want to have show up in the artifact or inside of your image, then all of a sudden this, this kind of rigidness of like, I have to go and pull all of my config files from you know, Git or something like this, ends up working out in your favor because at some point you're going to move from a couple of, or like one or two boxes to tens or hundreds and you're going to want to recreate that exact same environment. So uh, Beehive is coming. Um, it, it's, there's a lot of work that's been done there thanks to uh, the GSOC from last summer and um, Swills. There's, he also wrote a Vagrant mutate in order to take Vagrant files and move them between virtual, uh, not VirtualBox, but from between libvirt and Beehive, and there's a couple of others in there. Um, but Beehive support and Vagrant, that workflow actually exists on FreeBSD as well, and it's getting better. So I, I would encourage people to take a peek at this just because uh, as a BSD developer, I don't know about you, but Beehive is a little bit unapproachable unless you have like your, your you know, a sidecar of, of shell scripts that you use in order to initialize and bootstrap your local development environment when you're working inside of FreeBSD. I know I do that. So that's Vagrant. Okay, fine. So this is the development side of things. There's a little bit more that potentially to unpack there. Um, so multiple VMs, inside of a Vagrant file, you can actually do Vagrant up and then specify a host name and it'll spin up like, you know, Vagrant Nomad 1, Vagrant Nomad, you know, 30 or whatever. Um, and you can have multiple VMs or multiple servers per Vagrant file, which is nice for clusters, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, provisioner scripts are super, super useful. Um, it's important to make them reusable because that script you can actually use for other tools that build things. And then um, building ZFS images. It would be really nice if, if um, and it it's really is nice to have ZFS root images instead of UFS images. So um, does this sound kind of interesting to people? Like as a workflow, well, does this seem like, I mean, it's, this should be pretty approachable, this kind of stuff here. Does this seem like it would be useful to people in their workflow? And the answer I was hoping to get was, yes, I didn't realize it was that easy, and we would see more people using some of these rapid development tools. Whether or not it's bigger or not, you know, uh, officially it'd be nice, but unofficially, like, I really don't care. The whole point is, is, is getting the cost down to nothing. So 
you know, great, so if we've got this KPI, we have a strategy to go and reduce the cost of development, fantastic. Now, deployment, this is all I was talking about just on your laptop. So how do you do this inside of the cloud? Well, getting resources um, in the bare metal world is expensive and sometimes takes time, and you can have great providers that, and, and partners that help reduce that cost, but it's still not quite the same. There's a time and a place for that. Um, I, I'm definitely bullish on metal, as many know, but like, there's a cost to acquiring stuff, and it, and it, takes, um, it takes time uh, to make that happen, and you really do want to get that time down, right? Because that's one of the important uh, KPIs there. So. Um, quick GCE demo, um, and I arbitrarily chose GCE just because it's normally pretty fast, but what's it look like to work inside of a cloud environment? So in this case, this is, this is the walkthrough. So in this case, you download the SDK. Um, this is you know, all official instructions from Google. Um, uh, extract, install, set your path to their installed binary. Okay, that seems pretty easy. Now you've kind of opened up and unlocked this. Well, you log in, you ask for an update for all the random software because Google's continually innovating and changing their APIs and commands, so you have to do that periodically. Then I grab a list here. In this case, I created the MeetBSD project, and they did it in 30 seconds. Okay, fine, that's not too bad. Okay, if you've never worked inside of GCP, it turns out that like, you know, fuddling through figuring some of this stuff out, yeah, a little bit of friction there. Um, but the fact that it took 30 seconds to go and do something is kind of impressive. Okay, fine. So in this case, I wanted to go and config up a project. So I said, hey, G Cloud, show me a list of my projects. There's none set. Okay, fine. Okay, so G Cloud, here's my project that I really did mean this. Okay, fine, here you go. I can, you, you've now set your project through the command line. It's stateful. Um, so, and I'm gonna pause here for a second. How many of you use Terraform? This is what I was hoping for. Two, three. <laughs> uh, so, Paul, who's heard of Terraform? One, two, three, four, five. All right, five users. Um, and then, I'm, is anybody else here even come close to using it on a, you know, of those five? Okay, yeah, uh, zero. So, computing. <laughs> uh, computing is going through this interesting evolution, and and. It, if you go back into like the animal brain, Neanderthal times of computing, um, you know we understood things as you know uh, twisted pair of copper, like and, and and it was very physical, very you know very primal. Everything was manual. As time passes, and uh, we have you know basic automation. Um, this slide deck actually, I, I cribbed these slides from one of my coworkers who um, obviously wrote this with Linux in mind. Um, <laughs> But uh, we had basic automation. This is shell scripting, and this, is, this was you know, very, a dominant form of administration and consumption, or administration of, of resources that we had acquired. And as time passed, you know, we got you know, virtualization, where we were hardware virtualizing things, and that's great. And, um, but, and that provided us with, with some amount of, of value because you know, we were taking the cost of acquiring something. So it used to be that we were acquiring a physical server. Now we're acquiring a slice of a physical server. And that meant that because we had already acquired the physical server, acquiring the, the slice of the, of the physical server, the virtual server, uh, the cost went down, right? And so there's a theme here. Cost went down. And as we go to platforms, Right? It's going down even further. Right? VMware, these are all hardware virtualization is reasonably heavyweight by comparison. Platforms are making this even cheaper. And because they, they're, they're handling the, they, they've completely commoditized computing infrastructure, um, again, driving the cost further down. And what we're seeing now is we're actually coming out of these you know, hypervisors and we're moving to. Um, applications running on metal. And this is interesting because FreeBSD actually started this movement, right, with jails. Um, and it's kind of lost its way a little bit, and there's definitely some other players there. But data center as a computer, where you're deploying applications that span the entire uh, fleet of servers that you have in, in either your, your physical data center or in your cloud environment. And, um, you know, Docker is kind of uh, the, the leader in the market right now. Um, but really, all these things are running on Linux. Right? And what we really want is we want BSD up there. Or, you know, we actually want multi-vendor, we want dual stack, but. So as we make this transition from, you know, very primitive to slightly more advanced where we have automated everything and we're, we're continually redeploying applications, we have self-healing and all these, these other nice attributes so that we don't get paged in the middle of the night. Um, 
it doesn't come for free. Right? As we move to this, this automated world where computers are self-healing, you have auto-scaling groups, that didn't happen by accident. There was a lot of pre-planning and work that went into in order to figure that out. And turns out that in order to have the ability to have self-healing services, uh, the complexity goes up tremendously. So this is a, a, a kind of a, a logical diagram of somebody's you know, classic three-tier infrastructure um, as it would run inside of, in this case, Amazon. So you have you know, DNS right, um, hitting like some form of a CDN, talks to a load balancer, you talk to a handful of your, or M, in this case, M3 servers that are um, you know, handling your, your web tier, and then you go back through another load balancer and they talk to your application or API tier, and then maybe on the back end you're talking to some form of relational database that actually has your stateful information. Right? This is what most, uh, or, or definitely a significant portion of uh, customers in the wild end up deploying it. Infrastructure looks roughly like this, right? And that's complex, right? A lot of people, myself included, have spent a lot of time figuring out how to build these types of infrastructures and get really good at it, right? We just know, like, you know, I need this particular component, I need it deployed in this way, I need the network set up this way, uh, and, and I need to go and twiddle these couple of knobs here, and if I go and not do these three things over here, our uptime will be better because, you know, experience. But, you know, hiring people to go do this stuff is not necessarily the greatest strategy, so you do need some way of, of managing that complexity, and that means getting what we are able to intuit out of our heads and somehow describing that as a, uh, in some form or fashion. And so we've, you know, have, historically we had these CMDBs that were just enormous, and, and that's what you would have to do in order to describe all of the logical connections between your uh, infrastructure and trying to represent it in some kind of normal relational database type way. And that's great and all, but it, it's pretty complex and we don't want to be there. Instead, what we really want, if you look at this, you say, huh, that, that, that actually looks like a graph, right? That, 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 yes, there's a bunch of servers, but these connections, I see edges and I see vertices and you know what? We have something that represents infrastructure. We have mathematical tools to go deal with this. We have a direction, a, or an acyclic graph. And if we go and walk this acyclic graph, we can actually arrive at a result that we wanted in advance. And this is how what I will call modern infrastructure is actually being developed. It's not being driven by a CMDB. Instead, it's being driven by a codified description of a graph. So we're going to walk through that here now. So if you have um, your G Cloud prompt here and you say, hey, show me all of your zones because each one of these tiers, they, who knows what physical data center they are, but like, I need to pick some place to go and acquire these resources because E speed of light, that's not something that we figured out how to get around. So we're going to go and put a zone. Let's go figure that this. Uh, I can't. Okay. Okay, let's go and, and enable, the, the, even though we've signed up and done everything, we actually haven't enabled the API to go in and begin consuming, in this case, you know, the, the uh, compute engine services. Okay, fine, so I'm gonna go click on the grayed out. It says that there's a little button there. You said enabling, click on it, great. And now you can go, hey, give me a list of all the regions. And you can say, great, I've got, you know, a nice diverse, geographically diverse list of places where I can go and plop services. So inside of that, because we're on the West Coast, I'm gonna go figure out something here where I can go and, and drop off some servers. So I'm gonna go and pick US West 1A, and I'm gonna go and start building out a description of this infrastructure that I want. So in this case, I'm gonna go and say, hey, I'm talking to the Google provider. I'm gonna pass it in a series of credentials. Well, that looks kind of like a shell script or a variable. It turns out that's what that is. And I'm gonna um, plop it into the region here, I'm US West 1A, okay. So in order to do that, I gotta populate this account JSON file. Where does that come from? And in this case, because I'm talking to Google and I'm saying, hey, go spin up and do things, they're like, that's great, but you need to prove who you are, so you have to authenticate. So you go to the identity management, create a new service account, great. You want to enable and scope your, your responsibility for the purposes of this example. Uh, we're giving it basically root level privileges. And, um, you know, it spins out this wonderful piece of JSON. 
And uh, that's basically what your service account looks like. And from, from Google's perspective, private key included, this is yours. So I know that's the private key, but why not? Because the, the infrastructure is totally disposable. Like I can spin it up and spin it down, and like it's just random entropy as far as anybody's concerned. So I don't have to be too, too concerned about security for the purposes of demos. So I take this, fill out some, some defaults, US West 1, 1A, specify some you know, pretty conventional parameters. I'm using a dedicated private key here. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second, wrong direction. Uh, here we go. So now I'm to the point, I've got a relationship established with a cloud provider and I say, hey, I want to go have some resources. So uh, again, thanks to release engineering, we actually have official FreeBSD uh, images. And that's great because uh, I really don't want to be in the business of building images. I really want them to be already pre-populated in a way that I can easily consume. So from my perspective, and this is why I do donate to the FreeBSD Foundation, is I want that to be there as a service. I want FreeBSD images and I want them current and I want them to work and I want them to be stable. And I know of no other way to get that to happen because me personally, while I may want this stuff, I don't have the time to go do it. So I can solve that, I donate. So pick your poison. We've got a bunch of different releases here. In this case, I'm going to use 11 current stable. So I'm going to go plop that in here. And I'm going to say, hey, I want this version, you know, this particular thing. And that's you know, good to know, because in this case, I just set a variable inside of their object store effectively. So I say, hey, you know, I'm going to skip forward and show you kind of like the end result here, which is a neat thing. Let's go Terraform plan, and it go, go and evaluate this graph that I've, I've you know, only half shown you, and it'll go and plan out. It'll go query the APIs and figure out what you specified in your graph, in your DAG, and then it will tell you where there's missing components, and it'll go fill it out for you. So then I can go and say, hey, apply, right? Plan, apply, plan, apply. In this case, it goes off and it goes in and requested the resources, the right images, spun it up for me, and it, you can see the column on the left here all these empty strings, that's because there's no resource in this case. It, this was a blank project. And a bunch of these values are computed. We live in a, in a fully dynamic world. So managing this complexity, going back to that, that slide a while ago, when you're doing that, you used to know the IP address of your name servers and every element in your infrastructure. And that's kind of not the way that things work. At this point in time, you have to map the associations between different things, but you don't actually know what the values of the endpoints are actually going to be because you know, e-cloud provider. They're going to come back and give you something kind of arbitrary. So a few minutes pass, and all of a sudden I have a spun up host. I created the SSH key, and I can show it to you because it's totally ephemeral, which is a nice property again, face palm. Um, and I can spin it down. And these times, these order of magnitude in time, a minute and 30 seconds, okay, fine. But it, it's, it's really powerful because I can go in and crank the count up to 100, right? And it'll take five minutes, maybe 10 minutes. And I've just taken this, this thing that I developed because I had scripts in there. And I, I took that provisioning logic and I centralized, I factored it out of, out of my Vagrant file. And I reused it in my Terraform config here. Now I can go and plop it out and I can go and do 100 boxes, right? Using the exact same thing. That's pretty nice. Um, and so we have this, this, the ability here to go in and you know, reduce the cost for, uh, for, for production. I didn't have to go in and click on, a, on 100 things. I didn't have to go write a bunch of APIs. I wrote something that um, I'm going to show you here that, that is reasonably lightweight and human friendly. So um, Terraform bits here. Um, so blast radius is a biggie. You have automation. It's an incredibly useful tool, uh, like any gun. It is the biggest foot gun you can imagine if you don't decompose the risk domains in the way that you, you describe your infrastructure. You probably want to describe your, your accounts, your VPCs, separately from your application. If you decide that you want to accident or you twiddle something and it requires a uh, it requires the, the renaming, let's say, of your VPC or your account. You may blow everything up in an automated way uh, above that. So um, in there, I referenced using 
a image provided by FreeBSD Release Engineering. You can go spin your own images where you copy the image provided from the FreeBSD Foundation and you mutate it in such a way that, that is per application specific. And this is really nice because um, you can, at that point in time, uh, you have done all of your, your customization at build time of your own custom image, which means when you go spin up your own application, you're spinning something up that is already looks like what you expect it to look like, which means that the time that it takes to go and initialize something goes from potentially if you have to run configuration management, 10, 20, 30 minutes, down to like 60 seconds. Right? You want to pre-compute that delta, uh, and you can do that. Uh, use auto scaling groups and um, or, or some form of self healing for your instances, and uh, be very aware of what is a build time constant versus a runtime constant. Things that are dynamic, you definitely don't want to have cross the boundary into build time. You need to be able to resolve runtime things at runtime. And these are all concerns that you can do with um, BSD here. So, um, but th th there's work that's, that's had to go in to make that happen. Um, so yeah, do as much as you can at build time. And uh, you know, this last bit here is, is support standards, right? It turns out that most of the world thinks that bin bash is a thing. Uh, and it, this is a really frustrating sticking point. Bin bash is common, yes, but it is not a standard. Using bin, user bin env bash bugs me. <laughs> But it gets around portability problems. By supporting actual standards or coding things to bin bash, you've broken compatibility. This is an uphill fight at this point in time that, that you know, we as a community largely have to deal with. Uh, it's worth calling out. Um, because what we really want is you know, to go back to this part here where, where I specified the, the, the operating system. This config file, this example that I started with, it actually started out as Ubuntu, Ubuntu Trusty. And all I had to do was twiddle up two lines here, right? the organization where I pulled the, the original image from, in this case, FreeBSD org, um, and the, the operating system, the OS image. And that was it. That was all I needed to do in order to, to, to spin something up in order to consume FreeBSD because of all of the legwork that has gone into getting you know, the, our community operating system of choice um, in a such a state so that we can rapidly consume it. This didn't happen for free or overnight, and it took effort. And so thank you to everybody that has in, been involved in that. But we really want to go back to this like development to production kind of mindset, and that also takes effort and time. It hasn't happened. Um, it, it, yeah. So what we want is we want lots of free BSD in order to get from our laptop into uh, a production kind of world where we're actually creating these images, you can actually, using, uh, in this case, it's, uh, I'm referencing Packer, um, you can take the FreeBSD org ISO image, mutate it all in GCP, and then save the resulting image back in GCP without it ever coming back through your laptop. And then I can go and spin up my own clusters without ever having to do that. And the input into the Packer file is a codified thing. So uh, thanks to Brad, uh, we actually have the ability to go and do this where we can spin this thing out. And so there's a little helper wrapper script there that in this case that creates a UFS based image. Um, and it does that all on, locally on your machine. And the output of that is, is a Vagrant image. But you can take that exact image because you've codified it and you swap out the providers and I can now save it to the cloud or I can use some other form of uh, other target, which means that that shell script that I mentioned, the provider side of thing, you can factor that out and then reuse it so that between development and production, I'm using the exact same set of initialization scripts. And why would you even want to do any of this? Because we have covered a large range of things pretty shallowly. Because I just, I like using FreeBSD. It is my operating system of choice and production capacities. It's really, really pleasant to work in by and large, behaves itself. There's a lot of characteristics that I like about it. It's comfortable. But it doesn't come for free. That cost of getting something into production from development, from you know, my, my, my laptop, through some form of, of you know, codified way of, of creating an artifact that I can reuse in a cloud environment, doesn't happen uh, uh, for free. 
because what we really want to get to is back to the self-healing world. And that happens, like, this is a really important concept because in these shared cloud environments, your server will just disappear out from underneath you. The, either the hardware or the VM, it's just going to vanish. And when it vanishes, you need to be able to put another one in place and you need to not care. Right? I remember a time when we used to, I used to name servers based off of brands of soap. Um, I know a number of people that used to do that based off of, of characters in Star Wars. Great, we don't live in those times anymore. Um, so we're doing this, but like safety in numbers, right? They're like, I'll go back to the original set of slides, 22 million, 28,000, just you know, one, two, three orders of magnitude difference there. Safety in numbers is a big deal. Being it to, and to organizations, because that's a risk management strategy as a business, as an organization. I'm going to do something if somebody else has already done it with me or before me. Okay. If you want to go off on a limb and go do something, you can, but that takes an enormous amount of trust from the organization to go let you to go do that. Starting small, building these numbers up is really important. Really, really important. Because if you don't do that, then it becomes increasingly hard to either find the edge case bugs because just law of large numbers, there's not enough people tripping over the bugs or fixing them or finding things that are important enough to go and apply resources to go do something to cause an improvement. Okay. But it is possible. Um, I, uh, I know I've been involved in this. Uh, there's a young gentleman down here in the front who is currently maintaining the after effects of this. Um, FreeBSD ends up being a very efficient, if you could, like number of servers, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the ratio of number of servers and number of people involved administering per server, uh, it's fantastic. It, like, there is enormous benefits to doing this to businesses, but you can't do it without, frequently, you can't do that without some other organization paving the way. Again, safety in numbers. Um, I know, yeah. So the way that this gets measured and the way that this kind of work gets prioritized is through a handful of metrics that are just, this is all data driven, right? Like I didn't make any, the numbers up, like this is where we are. We need to change some of the numbers through usage because uh, this is what people will look at in order to determine what their appetite for risk is. Um, yeah, so if you do something on your laptop and you push it into production, there's a lot of concerns involved. We're not pushing into bare metal infrastructure nearly as much as we used to. I know that a huge chunk of the FreeBSD community is largely involved in embedded. And that's kind of a reality of, of the community at this point in time. But it cannot leave behind the server operations world, the app, network application, you know, consumer grade type deployments. And getting that, that, that the simple ideas from your laptop into production and stably so and maintained is really important. So of the tools that I mentioned earlier, um, license wise for people that are interested, this is all quite commercially friendly. Um, I did zip through that actually faster than I expected. So if there are questions, feel free to ask. Um, but my takeaway is, is as a community, we need to be very aware of how we are or are not being used in production environments because those numbers that come out, like that, that digital exhaust that come out of those deployments matters to people and that changes funding and prioritization. Thank you. Going once, twice, yeah. Can you email me about that uh, shell thing? Yeah, yep. Uh, by the way, thank you. Like most of this work, uh, portability-wise, would not have been possible without Glenn like, triaging and fielding a lot of these problems. Like the value of release engineering, can't say enough good things about it. Cool, thank you.